What up, though? It's your boy, Big Snoop D O Double J. Oh, my God. Gotta give a shout out to DJ Magic. You can hit him up on his Instagram. It's Magic's the Man at M A G I X T H E M A N. This is the Outside the Box podcast where we bring on celebrities, we bring on professionals, seven figure earners, and different successful people in the industry to come and unpack for the listeners on how to scale in their own business and think outside the box. Today, we have a very special guest named Nick Sly with Warner Music. I'm sure you guys are familiar with them. They have tons of different uh, umbrellas underneath their corporation, Atlantic Records, just to name one, and just some different artists that are multi-platinum and super duper successful. Um, Nick, for those that aren't familiar with who you are, where you're from and what you do, can you kind of give them a little bit of background on you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Nick Sly, as was said. Um, I work at A&R at Warner Records. I'm the Warner Music Group. I'm originally from Athens, Georgia, and I've been living in the Bay Area over the last couple of years. Um, now I'm finishing up my undergrad. Awesome. So so just kind of give us a little bit of background on that. Like, how was life growing up for you in Georgia? Like, were you very inspired by the music scene? Is that how you kind of got into this industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, since I was a baby, I mean, honestly, my grandma, my family put me on a lot of music. My friends, my neighborhood just kind of put me on the music from a really early age. Um, obviously, Southern hip hop was extremely influential. Outkast, Three Six Mafia, GZ, Ti, like all of that was, you know, very much. When I was younger, that was, you know, the music that was hot, the music that people really looked up to. So that kind of got me started. Kind of a mix between that and a bunch of soul and gospel music. Um, and yeah, I, ever since then, you know, I just felt such a deep love and appreciation for music, and I always knew it was something I wanted to work with if I got the opportunity to. Nice and. So just looking at your resume, you've done some really incredible work, starting with, you know, interning with Sony as an A&R and then, you know, moving over to uh, Warner and also Universal. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that was and and kind of unpack for the listeners what kind of experience coming from prestigious school like Stanford prepared you for those kinds of roles? Yeah, for sure. So I think, uh, yeah, my first real experience in the music industry, I did digital strategy. So this got a lot of marketing and finance type stuff with Warner Music Group a couple years ago. And then from there, went to RCA under Sony, where I did A&R. Um, and then did artist development last summer with Universal. So, you know, a lot of A&R type marketing stuff. And now I've been back with Warner since then, and Warner Records doing A&R. Um, and for me, coming, coming from Stanford, I think, Stanford helped me get a foot in the door at the beginning, um, especially, I'm an econ major. Our school doesn't really have anything that's like suited for kind of the modern music business. So econ was kind of like the most relevant thing that I could study. So that gave me a good foot in the door to get started with that digital strategy and finance internship with Warner Music Group. And then from there, I was able to just kind of build internally and then expand over more of the creative side of the industry. So I think that, you know, being in Stanford really helps with that. I think that, you know, Stanford doesn't really have as robust of like a music program or a music business program as other schools that are much more entertainment focused, like a USC, like an NYU. But I think that, you know, just being able to study economics here, like has been, you know, a really good opportunity to understand the business side of things. And I've really been able to translate that because, you know, that's a side that you need to know regardless of what part of the industry you are. You need to at least know to some level how business is going to function because at the end of the day, you know, record labels are companies, they are corporations, and, you know, they have a lot of the same motives and incentives that a lot of companies across various other industries do. So understanding those things is going to be important regardless. Exactly. And kind of unpack that a little bit. Like, for the listeners, what kind of real-time experience do you feel like you got out of the college versus the hands-on? Because that's kind of the bigger thing, right? Some people get into the industry based on relationships and kind of just, you know, um, getting their hands dirty versus, you know, maybe coming from a situation where you're like learning and you're doing projects and different things to that degree. Like for yourself, how important were relationships in like getting your foot in the door? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so my first job, I didn't know anybody in the industry. And there's just very few people. My school is just, like, very tech-heavy. You know, a lot of, we send a lot of people to Silicon Valley. We send a lot of people in the software engineering world. So, for me, I didn't re- I didn't know anybody at all, like, during my whole freshman and sophomore year. I, never, I still really never met anybody at my school, or really even a long my school, hardly, who work in the music industry and who have done work in the music industry. But for me, 
I applied for an internship with Border Music Group, and then that kind of got the ball rolling. And then everything started to kind of piece itself together from there. Um, I applied and I got an internship. Never met my boss before, obviously, but um, he ended up being incredibly helpful, amazing guy, just super nice, incredibly insightful, very intelligent, understood the music industry very well, and really helped me navigate from there to figure out, you know, what exactly do I want to do within the industry, what's going to suit my skill set the best, what's going to, you know, help me level up and go to the next level of my career, you know, what other internships to be looking for and applying to. And so he really helped me through that and just understanding how the music industry works. And then, you know, the following the following experience I got was going to um, RCA, going over to RCA and doing A&R there. So then that was really kind of my foot in the door on creative. Um, and again, with RCA, they didn't know anybody there, just applied for the opening and it worked out mesh with the team, had that experience, and then just kept kind of like parlaying the experiences I built into newer ones and being able to keep growing across different companies and across different labels. Exactly. So speaking about that and like, you know, having a really great mentor, how important is mentorship to you? Incredibly, incredibly important. I think that, yeah, my first boss at Warner, I mean, he was, he was fantastic. He was so helpful. And... Had I not had a manager that was just so involved and thoughtful and careful with how he approached that relationship and how he approached the ability to mentor me, and even to this day, he's somebody I know I can still contact at any point and he's going to be there to help, I think that was incredibly helpful. And had I not had that, I would have been less encouraged to keep going and keep applying and keep discovering and navigating this whole industry because it can be really complex and complicated, especially if you don't have the background and the knowledge in it. It can be really hard to navigate that, but getting that really good, really solid, really reliable mentor for me was incredibly important. Awesome. So just kind of looking at the roster here with Warner Records, you got everybody, Legacy Acts from Green Day, David Guetta, um, Deftones, Dua Lipa, the Black Keys, and even newer artists, Baby Tate. Kind of talk about that a little bit as far as, you know, having that synergy and being able to be professional and work with artists because a lot of people come in this realm and they get starstruck. How is that for you rubbing shoulders with some of the greatest talent, some of the greatest executives? Yeah, no, I think it's it's definitely incredible. Like I say, I think Warner has one of my favorite rosters of, of any major label out there. And I also think it's just a great team of people that make it up, you know, particularly on the creative side. Um, a lot of the high-level A&Rs and execs, I think, are really cool, really great people who have done really amazing things in the music industry and who have a bunch of experience working on a bunch of different really cool things. So I think, yeah, from a, from a label side, I think, you know, all the people I've met have been fantastic. It's been great to work with them. I've learned a lot from all the people I've come across. Um, definitely very, a lot of very, like, impressive people who are very established in music. And, you know, that could be, that could be a little bit intimidating when you're, you know, entry level, you know, just getting your career started off to be in the same rooms with those people. But I really see it as much more just a blessing and an opportunity to learn and be around those people. It's just such a great thing. And on the artist side, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, like there's a bunch of incredible artists who are signed to Winter Records, you know, either legacy or current. And so that's just another process, you know, you kind of, the first few times you just, the superstars walking around the office you're like oh wow like this is really you know you're, you're really working in the major label you know you just see them casually come in for a meeting or two or you know whoever's got to go to the studio to meet up with whoever you know platinum selling artists you know it's you you become a little bit conditioned to it over time but you know each time it still feels it still feels kind of crazy connecting that world you know growing up you know you idolize these artists, you you think that they're these untouchable, you know, superstars, and then you get older and you start working with them, and it just starts, you slowly bridge that gap, so you kind of get used to it over time, but you never really fully get used to, you know, being in these spaces and, and collaborating with some of these artists, but it's a great, it's such a great opportunity, it's a, it's, it's a blessing and a great experience to be able to work with a bunch of great people and a bunch of great artists. So as far as your experience inside, like you're saying, walking around the superstars, everything like that, and, you know, connect with the executives. So give us three things that you've taken away that are, you would say are gems are super important to know. If, if you were able to tell your, yourself walking in the door for the first time, three things before you came in, based on what you know now, what would those three things be? Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, most importantly for me is just be proactive and reach out regardless of how you think it's going to get received. 
Um, I think that especially, you know, like we were just talking about, if you're dealing with superstar artists, if you're dealing with high level executives at the label, it can be really easy just to shut down and shut off and just, you know, like kind of like freeze in their presence and not really take advantage of the opportunity. But those people have so much to learn from and so much to offer. And they're often way more willing to help share their knowledge than you would think, you know, and it doesn't have to even be the craziest thing. It could just be 15 minute chat with, you know, one of the executives at the label. It could be, you know, just stopping, hanging out with the artists real quick, talking to them about what they've got in their upcoming project, getting in touch with them, getting to hear a couple of those tracks, you know, getting to talk to the manager of the artist, uh, an incredibly overlooked part of that whole relationship between the artist and the label, you know, getting to talk to the manager and learning about all the ins and outs, the daily artist's life, what being a manager's like. You know, so I think just if you if you come across somebody that you have like a genuine passion and interest for what they do and what they've done, um, being proactive and reaching out, like I think that that's a hundred percent something that you know you gotta you you can't be intimidated by people's positions and success, and you gotta look at it the opposite way and see that as you know a blessing and opportunity to learn from them and take advantage of that chance to be in the same room with them and make sure that you you know capitalize on that moment and you're able to learn something from them or at least just establish a genuine connection with them at the very least. I think, what are some, what are some other gems? I think, I also think, I mean, for people pursuing a career in the industry, I think that getting a foot in the door kind of in any lane is helpful. And I think that everything is, everything ends up being much more interconnected than you think it would. Um, and really any skill you're building relating to music in any aspect of the industry is incredibly helpful. But the first thing I did was did a digital strategy and finance, so it was a lot of finance relating to marketing. Um, and you would think that that wouldn't have anything to do with A&R, you would think they're completely unrelated roles, and that me doing that wouldn't help me at all. But it's just being in the industry, it's giving yourself that chance to be in those rooms, to meet the right people, to learn about other areas of the industry and then to really find out what you want. So I would say, I would encourage people to also just not be too narrow about what they want. I know you might think you want to do sync licensing or brand partnerships or A&R or marketing or whatever the case, but I genuinely encourage, especially in the early career phase, that career exploration within the industry, I think there's so much to learn from everything. And I think everything is a lot more interconnected than people would think. Like the things that I learned on the marketing and the finance side, are still incredibly helpful in A&R and there's still very valuable things to know in terms of signing an artist, in terms of developing an artist, in terms of putting together an album rollout campaign, everything. Like I, learning these skills, any skill you learn relating to music is going to help you in the long run, for sure. That's super good. Yeah, so for the listeners, don't sleep on your cross-functional skills. When you look at a resume and you're putting that together, you might have clerical here or music licensing here or clearance. I completely understand. For me working in iHeartRadio, I had to clear music if it was playing for a commercial. So it's kind of the same thing, right? So there's you have cross-functional skills that move from this area to that area. So don't, you know, don't underestimate yourself and think that um, basically your skills might not translate and absolutely they do. So always keep that in mind. So for those that are listening at all day, every day, there's many people outside that might have issues with people basically not believing them, doubting them. What's your advice on that? Maybe, maybe some of your own experience where you've had people doubt you and then that's pushed you to the next level or how do you ev- evade that or circumvent that? What are your thoughts to the listeners that have doubters and people that don't believe in their dreams? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's always going to be people. I mean, I think that if you only keep your dreams, if you only keep your work, if you only keep your skills, your passions, whatever it is that means something to you, to yourself and the people that are going to be essentially yes men, the people, you know, that are only going to support that, then you're never really going to be able to maximize the potential of those dreams and those talents. You have to start to expand beyond the people that are going to initially accept you and praise you every time. And that's a part of growing and that's a part of just developing and using those talents and those skills and you're never going to be able to accomplish your dreams unless you're putting yourself through a bunch of situations where people are doubting you. So if you've got people doubting you, if you've got people saying that your dreams are too far-fetched, if you've got people that are saying you don't have the skill set needed to to, you know, to start this career, to progress in this career, I think, honestly, that's literally a more positive thing to hear than it is a negative. 
Because if you're only doing things where, oh, okay, yeah, of course you could do that, you're really underselling yourself and you're really not living up to what your potential could be and you're really not following through on what your dreams are. If you're always putting yourself in those positions where it's just comfortable, everybody praises it, everybody loves it, there's never anything new, there's no growth, there's no criticism, there's no constructive feedback, there's just never going to be any growth. So if you're always in that state, things are never going to actually develop and progress in the way you want them to. So having doubters and having people not think that you can accomplish the things you want to is just a natural part of doing anything that means anything to you at all. And it can really serve as motivation. There's a lot of good things that can come out of it. And it's all about just taking perspective on it and flipping it from something that's negative or something that's derailing to your career into something that's constructive and something that you can learn and build off of so you can both know, one, that your aspirations are being validated, that you're really pushing for something that's out of your comfort zone and that you're really striving for growth. And also, you know what to work on and you know how to make that process smoother in the future and you know how to get better on those areas that you need to. Man, that's a really good one for the listeners out there. Don't become complacent in your comfortability and challenge yourself. And that is so correct. Like if you're not being challenged, you're basically not going to put the best effort in. If you're constantly just searching for those small little wins that just give you that little bit of praise, it's like, you're always going to be in this little box. You're going to be in this comfort zone. Think outside the box, you guys. Now talk a little bit about what's next for you. And and it's hard to kind of imagine an in game because things always evolve. Right. But where do you see yourself in this ecosystem? Are there any uh, innovations that you want to bring to the music industry? Like what What's, what's the future for you? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, for, for my early career, I'm definitely planning to uh, continue doing a and in kind of the major label world. Um, so I've got, I've got some new moves planned and that um, making a, a slight a slight change in my career path um, in these next couple of months. But yeah, definitely staying in um, A&R in the major label scene for the foreseeable future. Eventually, I really want to get into management. Um, I really think that that's a, you know, a skill that I could really provide to artists with. Um, And I think maybe even eventually I want to get into more producing my own art. So production on my end, um, mixing and mastering, kind of learning some of the more, some of the more back end skills and music creation. Um, Learning and honing in on those is, you know, a big part of what I want and see in my future. Um, but yeah, working in that, on that side, getting into management eventually. And I have a dream of starting my own record label one day. So I would really love to, you know, one day down the road, be able to have my own label with a handful of artists that I'm incredibly passionate about and just being able to build and work together and kind of do our own thing, whether that's a joint venture with a major label, like a dream build type, or whether it's a fully independent venture. Um, I think that that's something that's, those are things that I very much want to, you know, by the end of my career, have accomplished, you know, wow. working in A&R, major label, being heavily involved with management, some of my favorite artists, and then eventually uh, creating my own record label. Wow, that's incredible. Definitely, uh, that's crazy you said that. We were just at Dreamville Fest, and we actually work with Dreamville, so that's really incredible. Maybe I can connect those dots for you. Uh, let's definitely hop on the line. Let's talk about that. Um, so for those that want to connect with you and like learn more about what you do or just see what you have going on, can you drop uh, where they can connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, feel free to give me a follow on Instagram at nicknick.flyslig.com. Or on LinkedIn under the same name, Nick Sly. Uh, Twitter at Nick underscore Sly. And yeah, those are the main, yeah, those are my main platforms. Awesome. You guys heard it there. It's DJ Magics, M-A-G-I-X-T-H-E-M-A-N. Back at you again with some more information and keep thinking outside the box.